Welcome everyone and thanks for joining this webinar entitled In-House Captioning Workflows and Economic Analysis. I'm Lily Bond from 3Play Media and I'll be moderating today. I'm joined by Corey Singleton, the Assistive Technology Initiative Manager at George Mason University who has a great presentation prepared for you. His presentation should take about 30 minutes and then we'll leave 15 minutes for questions at the end. And before I hand it off to Corey, we have a poll so that we can get a better sense of how everyone is currently captioning. Great, so the question is, how are you captioning now? And you can select in-house or DIY, vendor, a combination, other, or not currently captioning. So I'll just give you a second to answer that and then uh, we'll get the results up. Great, thanks everyone. So you can see a lot of people are using a combination of in-house and vendor captioning. Otherwise, a lot of you are using in-house and some of you are not currently captioning. So that's really great to know as we move forward into this presentation. So with that, I will hand it off to Corey. All right, Lily, thank you for having me. My name is Corey Singleton. I'm the ATI manager here at George Mason University, and I'm going to talk to you about our experience with captioning in-house and outsourcing. We basically got started probably about five years ago, and so I first met Toll Kasson over at the ATIA conference several years ago when we were doing an update on the very first year of our pilot project with captioning. And so I'm going to talk some about that, but I'm also going to talk about what kind of updates we've done since that time. So just a little bit about our office and our university. George Mason has roughly about 34,000 students the enrollment this semester. Um, we're the largest four-year public institution in the state of Virginia. We have just, just over 1,400 full-time instructional and research faculty and just under 400 part-time faculty members. We have four campus locations in the United States here in Northern Virginia, uh, Fairfax, Arlington, Prince William, and Loudoun and one international location, Songdo campus, which has opened up probably about three years ago or so now, something like that. If you have more info or you want more info about our university, you can go to the about.gmu.edu website. So just briefly about my office, I manage the Assistive Technology Initiative, and I'm not going to read this long written mission statement here, but basically our task here at the university is to adjust technology accessibility. And that's in the classroom, on the web. We also work with students, staff, faculty, and visitors. The services that we provide encompass accessible text and accessible media. We also provide web accessibility consultations and training here at the university. That also includes web testing and web-based applications testing. And we provide informal assistive technology assessments for students, staff, and faculty with disabilities. We also provide ITAT support and training as well. So the last thing I'll share is about our reporting structure. I'm not sure you know about the spread here as far as the listeners, but at our particular campus, our unit is actually housed under the Compliance, Diversity, and Ethics Office. We're not under the Office of Disability Services or, and we're not under the Information Technology Unit. Those are models that may be used at some other higher education institutions. But here we report directly to the ADA coordinator who reports directly to the VP for Compliance, Diversity, and Ethics who reports directly to the university president. So a nice thing about that is for some of the initiatives that we have in place, we're able to kind of do a little more pushing in terms of, of compliance than we are in other areas. And so uh, if you want to learn more about my office, ati.gmu.edu is the website. And I'm also posting a copy of this particular PowerPoint presentation on our website as well. All right, so let's get started with the process. I'll talk about how we got started, how we've evolved, and what those next steps looked like. Five years ago, sir, now, we didn't have a captioning solution at all. And so what that meant is that whenever we ran into a situation for a student who was deaf or hard of hearing in a course, there was always this argument about who was going to be paying for what. And that argument would be between our office, the Office of Disability Services, the academic unit. And so you would still be several weeks into the course before you figured out who was paying for it and, and, and where you were actually going to get the service done and where you were going to post it. We had a really siloed university in terms of IT services at that time. And so you really didn't have the enterprise systems that we have now 
and and so you ran into a lot of issues on how you were actually even going to deliver the content once you had it captioned. So one thing we did was we were pushing for about a year or so to try and see if we could get the docs off AV unit. I'll talk a little bit about what that unit is like very briefly. But to get the unit, you had to pay roughly about fifteen thousand up front, which was a big hurdle for us. So we paid about a third. We partnered with the Keller Institute for Human Disabilities, which is a part of our College of Education and Human Development, and they covered the rest of it up front. And since we've been splitting the annual maintenance costs with them, we manage the service, meaning we provide access to the license, we provide licenses, we provide training on how to use the web-based application and how to use the transcript editor applications, and we were marketing and promoting the service as well. And Keller had the um, unit actually installed on their server, and they set up the website for us. For those who don't know, Docsoft basically is a web-based application that takes advantage of the Dragon Naturally Speaking transcription engine. And so you can upload any audio or visual content, I'm sorry, audio or video content, and it would transcribe it and give you an automatic transcript. Now, it's not a perfect transcript. It depends on the quality of the audio that you put up. But that was kind of the basis of what we uh, used to start our captioning process. Now. Just to kind of update on what happened, a year after putting that in place and going out and marketing and talking to different folks in ITU and academic units and all that kind of stuff, we still had nobody really captioning. The unit wasn't being utilized, and um, we had one staff member who did it through a small grant. I think she hired a couple of um, students to help her uh, caption some of the videos that they had for a project in their particular school. And we had one staff member who transcribed some images interviews for her research project. And of course we had graduate students who wanted to use it for transcribing their own research as well. And so what we kind of realized is that we just kind of had an ill-conceived plan. We, we were focused so much on trying to get the unit here that we didn't really put in place a good plan for training and for carrying through use, you know, or rather encouraging use uh, by those in the community. So. But for those we did encourage and we, where we thought we were doing a good job, we got a lot of pushback. And some of the things we heard, I'm sure you guys know, there's this myth about voice transcription that I'm just going to talk to the computer and everything I say is going to automatically be there, perfect punctuation and everything, and I won't have to do any cleanup. So we were getting pushback because of that. We also were getting pushback because faculty and staff members, they lack the time and resources to really do it on their own. And that means you didn't have student workers who were going to clean the transcripts for you. You didn't have time to clean up your own transcripts. So we ran into a lot of issues with that. We also pushed back because faculty members, some faculty members really struggle honestly with using Microsoft Word effectively or using PowerPoint effectively. So now you throw this other educational technology at them and they were like, well, this is, you know, a bridge too far for me. So we were getting pushed back in that, re in, in that respect as well. One thing we were starting to hear quite a bit, though, is that why don't you do it for me? Why don't you do it for me? And so the next evolution was for us to say, well, all right, we'll do it. And we'll do it if you give us staff. And if you give us money, well, yeah, sure, we'll do it because we, we're familiar with the technology. We're familiar with what we're asking you to do. So we'll kind of proceed in that direction. And so one thing we did was we wrote a proposal and submitted that up the chain here at Mason for increased staffing for money to pay the continued maintenance costs and to see if we could develop an in-house process based on supporting students who are deaf and hard of hearing in the classroom and also based on improving compliance in our new distance education program. So we submitted a proposal. It was approved, got submitted in January 2011, approved in June 2011. And the, most of the costs that were covered actually went towards staffing and some other kind of technology-related costs. We did set aside some money for outsourcing, but most of the money really did go to our us hiring two graduate students and moving our accessible text coordinator, who was part-time at the time, to a full-time position where she oversaw both the text process and the new media process. And we also set aside a little bit of money for unexpected costs related to audio description. There were times where we were going to start to get requests for students who have visual impairments needing to access videos in the class, which need, we needed descriptive videos. So we wanted to make sure that we had a solution for that as well. We spent the latter part of that summer doing training and setup. That means we were training the graduate students on 
a process that we were going to implement. We started working with one instructional designer as a part of the pilot project, and she had, I want to say, probably about 10 to 15 faculty members that she was working with to help them develop their online courses. She probably had more. That's what I can remember from the number that I had interaction with. But what we kind of decided to do was to, you know, so we'll, we'll focus on using, converting everything into a Windows Media Player file or Windows Media file. Um, we were pulling content from everywhere, YouTube, GMU TV, iTunes, DE Course, and Mason channels. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that handoff as well. Basically, you were kind of taking plugins and tools. One of our um, staff members calls it a chop shop. We really were running like a little chop shop here where you were pulling videos from everywhere. Um, and that was because the faculty members were incorporating videos into the courses that came from everywhere. And so they weren't all nicely, neatly packaged on a um, thumb drive or on a CD drive or DVD for you or whatever. And so part of that training that we had with the graduate students was teaching them how to go and pull these videos from a lot of these different places. Um, and that ended up increasing our turnaround time. In order to kind of familiarize ourselves with the process, we had a three-week turnaround time on jobs just to kind of familiarize ourselves with everything that was going on. Um, and so this was our initial workflow. Basically, um, an email would come in. We had set up actually an online, um, um, an online request form through our uh, CMS at the time. And the graduate student would actually pull it down, the video, they would go through the file preparation process, which is what I talked about, depending on where that file was coming from. It would get uploaded to Docsoft, downloaded. Um, they would download the transcript once it was, once it was transcribed. Then we would use Docsoft to clean it up. And um, then it would go back to what we had at the time with the GMU streaming servers. So we had streaming media servers here on campus, one for QuickTime, one for Windows Media Player, or one for Windows Media Files, and one for Flash Files. And it wasn't a popular service because many faculty members were using using the servers more to store content than the stream content. So we were going to try and take advantage of it for streaming, but we ran into a lot of limitations on what we could do with the streaming server, like uh, limitations on file account size and things like that. Um, but basically, we were going to use that as the basis for how we delivered the videos that we um, that we provided captions for. And then what we would do is host the uh, linking files, the captions and the linking files on our web server, and try to merge the two together. So that was our initial workflow. And so the pilot project results, um, we had kept uh, over the course of the fall fall 2011, we captioned um, roughly about 12 hours of video, no, no audio description requests. Um, most of the submissions actually came directly from the instructional designer herself by way of the staff member. Um, and we had some requests that came from staff members um, who were captioning videos for websites. We identified all kinds of issues. Um, with Windows Media files, they, the captions wouldn't actually pull through for folks who were using um, a Mac. So we had a lot of issues there. We also ran into buffering issues. We had large like if you had an HD file, the video could easily be one gigabyte. And so then trying to actually stream that would cause a lot of issues. And so um, we had a lot of complaints around buffering. File prep and timing. The students really struggled with pulling videos from all these different places and then getting it to a point where they were just starting the work. Um, so the timing really affected us as well because a lot of faculty members didn't want to wait three weeks for their stuff. Um, the streaming server was a whole other issue because it was unreliable. We had five gigabyte account limits. Um, and so, again, like I said, you have one video that can be one gigabyte. There's only a limit to what I can do on mine, which means I'd have to coordinate with the faculty member on their own personal account. And, and it just became a, a huge headache in terms of handoff. Uh, we had a lack of technical knowledge. I talked about that with the faculty and staff before, but there were a lot of things we really had to figure out too in terms of how we standardize the process, how we clean up the process, and how we make it attractive for people to want to um, come to us to request the service. Um, and marketing was a big thing too. We just had a lot of issues with marketing effectively. And so uh, in the spring, in January 2012, what we did was we, we put in place a, pro a few things to actually clean up the process. Um, we centered everything around YouTube as our delivery method because that got us out of trying to figure out which particular file formats we had to figure out. 
um, to improve the captioning quality that the graduate students were putting out. We went to the WGBH best practices and really tried to improve the, the, the quality of the captions that the students were putting together. Um, we put in some procedures for addressing video description, uh, video description requests and outsourcing. Basically, anything over 60 minutes um, automatically went out to um, outsource. And so we started to figure out that you know, if you give a student an hour video or more than an hour video and they sit down and have to crank it out, basically time frames are running for every minute of video, they're probably taking eight, nine minutes, sometimes ten minutes depending on the student, um, to actually transcribe that content. And so that would lead into a couple of days of them working on just one video. And so that would affect time frames as well. Uh, lack of technical knowledge, we just trial and error, we just kind of figured some things out um, through a lot of trial and error. And with marketing, we went to what I, I've been kind of terming this, um, what I say are choke points. These are places where we knew faculty were going. One thing we have difficulty with is getting in front of faculty ourselves just to talk about accessibility. But we can work through specific channels in our university who we know faculty are going to. Their faculty are going to orientation workshops. They're going to the Compliance, Diversity, and Ethics Office for training. They're going to work directly with instructional designers, they're working with library personnel, they're working with the um, Office of Distance Education. So to go and work with those, partic those particular folks to be our champions somewhat, the, those, those people can relay messages and integrate accessibility much more effectively into their processes than us trying to go and push it uh, on our own. So those, that was a really effective way for us to get the message out as well. And so we updated our workflow process. The areas in green that you'll notice, I'll point out those. Instead of having the first one, except the ACT Media Coordinator preps the file here on the bottom right. Basically, we took that whole prep, that file prep um, process out of the hands of the student. So they didn't have to figure out all those things. Either the Accessible Media Coordinator or myself were figuring out how to get the files and then prep them. Basically, we would upload them to Docsoft and then the student would just have to come and pull them down and transcribe the content. So that saved a lot of time. And then we kind of got away from just using the docs off transcript editor to say, let's just use whatever whoever it's com whatever you're comfortable with as far as transcribing. If you want to use Notepad, you want to use Movie Captioner, you want to use docs off, doesn't matter. Use whatever you're comfortable with because the final product is the same no matter what. And then again, using um, our um, YouTube, we were able to standardize it down to specific uh, file types. So file types for video didn't really matter. We could upload most anything, but we focused on SRT file types as far as the caption. And on the left-hand side, you'll see the outsourcing where um, anything over th over 60 minutes we automatically sent out to kind of help um, minimize the amount of time they were spending on on certain types of videos or long videos. And so that was what we did um, to clean up everything and get to that first um, year. Of, of captioning. And so I'll talk about the numbers briefly but uh, in a second, but I want to talk a little bit about our evolution in, the, in, the pre, in, in these recent two years. Um, and so what we found in the second year of the process is that YouTube was familiar. So a lot of people, a lot of faculty members were really familiar with YouTube so they were very comfortable um, using that platform, whether it was personally or, or for or school or whatever. Some even had their own accounts so it was something that they were comfortable using. We ended up having um, two and a half times the number of requests in the second year than we did in that first year. Um, the accessibility was starting to be incorporated in the DE course review process. So whenever they developed distance education courses, accessibility was starting to be looked at as, as one of those things before a course would go live. And we were able to reduce our turnaround time to about seven to ten days with some of those updates I talked about. The bad thing is we still had a lot of manual handoff. So, even though we were outsourcing content um, and doing some in-house stuff, you still were uploading to YouTube, pulling down from YouTube, uploading to the vendor site, pulling down from the vendor site. So that handoff kind of resulted in lost time as well. Um, lack of predictability. I couldn't tell you how many numbers or how many requests we were going to get from one semester to the next. So we couldn't really um, plan in terms of budget and we couldn't really plan in terms of um, staffing sometimes. It was a little difficult to understand. The graduate assistants were still struggling with immediate requests. If we found out a student was enrolled in a course and they didn't get their videos done and you know the videos happen to be 45 minutes long, you're still running into an issue um, with that 60 minute time 
uh, cutoff, which we had. Retraining graduate students, hiring, losing, re rehiring student workers, that was a big issue for us too. And then the copyright issues. We had, <laughs> we had one YouTube account, which we had unlimited um, uploads and everything too. And then it got flagged, it became illegal, so when we said, all right, we'll set up a, another YouTube account. So we had an illegal account, and then we had an illegal account, and that's kind of how we operated for a while. And so the year after that, um, the university kind of made this shift towards um, using Kaltura, and so that platform shift really helped us in terms of scalability. Um, everybody was kind of making this move towards a video management hosting platform that the university would uh, put in place and support, and it was accessible. They had the 508 player and, and a number of other accessibility features that made it easy for us to get buy-in in terms of people moving towards Kaltura. So that was a great thing that happened in, in this last fiscal year. Uh, we started to see growing predictability. We had almost three times the number of requests just this past fiscal year than we did in the previous fiscal year. We did some negotiations uh, with captioning vendors to um, uh, for outsourcing, so that way we were able to um, reduce costs by negotiating for, uh, with vendors up front. Uh, we improved our workflows and we've actually reduced our turnaround time to about four business days now. We still had some copyright issues. We had a third YouTube account actually because one got uh, flagged again, mainly because um, we still have a number of folks who are very comfortable using YouTube. They haven't moved towards Kaltura yet. The university as a whole is still uh, they were piloting it last year. It was supposed to be fully implemented in the fall of this year, but it still hasn't been fully implemented for everybody to take advantage of yet. So we're still doing some handoff in, in that respect. But once it's fully implemented, it'll be much easier. And then the bad is just outsourcing costs are still high, so we're driving that price down. And so our most up web updated workflow, I'm only going to talk about the green areas again. Um, Kaltura is a big part of what we're doing now. That's actually the larger part. It's pretty much taking over YouTube in that respect. We're still using YouTube and Kaltura. It depends on what the faculty member is using, but we're encouraging and pushing folks towards Kaltura. And as far as our outsourcing, we've actually cut it down to anything over 15 minutes or that we know is an immediate need in the classroom gets automatically outsourced. We don't even think about it. So the nice thing about that is that Stuff that's 15 minutes we know can, can get cranked out in a day's time uh, and even pretty short order depending on, on who's doing and how comfortable they are with captioning. All right, so this is what the numbers look like. In our first year when we did the pilot, we had about 147 uh, video requests that were completed. In the second year, we jumped up to 371 just this past fiscal year. When I say fiscal year, I'm going from July 1 to June 30th we had just over a thousand videos and so far this year I actually have 880 we're slightly under 880, 880 about 872 or so but so far this year um, we're at almost we're at close to 900 requests and spring semester is always our biggest semester um, this past spring we did about almost 600 requests and every in, in the track record has been that every spring we double the previous spring so if that's the case um, and our ACT Media Coordinator, Courtney, may not want to hear this, but we may be looking at roughly about um, anywhere between 800 and 1,000 just next semester is what we're kind of expecting. All right, so let me talk about costs. Um, this is a breakdown of our costs by fiscal year. The first, um, FY12 being our pilot year, FY13 uh, being the second year, and then um, just this past fiscal year or this past uh, June is when we ended fiscal year 14. And so the big things that I've highlighted here um, are the average cost per minute outsourcing. And so you'll see in our, in our pilot year uh, that we were paying about $2.94 per video minute um, and for outsourcing. And we've been able to drive that cost down significantly with some of the changes that we've made. We're down at roughly about $2.35 per minute now. And I know we'll be much lower going into this fiscal year, um, FY15, because we're um, still looking at um, um, captioning contracts, but we're also, uh, the uh, contracts weren't signed until the midpoint of this past year. Um, and so the other thing you'll notice are the in-house numbers underneath that, that um, top highlighted line. And so for in-house, the reason we're able to capture the cost in that 
pilot years because we use our graduate students solely for captioning, where they weren't used for anything else. Now any student workers we hire kind of bounce between whatever we need them for, but we use the two that we hired then solely for captioning. And so if you look, they did about 171 jobs combined, and the average cost per video, video minute for the in-house, uh, for our um, in-house work was about $5.87. And honestly, if we had just gone ahead and outsourced those minutes, um, we would save close to $7,000 doing that. And so in the, in the last two years, we didn't use students solely for that work. And we also had other ways that we were kind of recapturing costs. We started working with the library to ask um, um, uh, folks that they have uh, subscriptions with some of the subscription content, they would go back to the publisher and ask them to caption some videos. And some have actually gone ahead and done that. We've been able to find SRT files actually surprisingly online for certain things. If you look on certain websites like PBS, content's already captioned in many places, uh, TED Talks as well. So um, by going out and finding those things, we've been able to not spend that money that you see there um, in that bottom line in fiscal year 13 and 14. And so just to kind of break down that pilot year a little bit more, um, and this is just kind of a highlight again. Again, the average cost per video minute outsourcing was $294. Average cost per video minute for our students was $5.87. And I'm breaking it down per student now. So our first student actually um, was the one that struggled more than the other. And the average cost per video minute for uh, that particular student was $7.93. And the average cost for the second student was actually $3.26. So he was more in line closer to what we had in terms of average than the first student. Now one thing I want to say is it wasn't that student's sole fault. I, we really didn't set them up for success in the beginning because they were kind of there doing all of the kind of nuts and bolts of figuring out the download process and figuring out which which formats and all that. And while some students who are a little more tech savvy can kind of bounce back and forth between those things, this particular student struggled with that part of it. And so I think by just getting those students out of the hands-on process, the muck of trying to fill, figure out all those details, they were able to just focus on uh, captioning. I think it was much better in the end than it was in the beginning. And so I think that's what that cost actually reflects as well. So just summarizing, um, these are now our strategic partnerships that are built around accessible media here. Again, we used the Keller Institute. Uh, in the beginning, they were a huge part of us being able to get that Docsoft platform in place. Uh, and we haven't been using the Docsoft uh, platform as, as much going forward, but it's still kind of a part of what we do. It's, a, it's, it's still a piece, a, a one of the tools in the, in the um, toolbox, so to speak. Ongoing, we work closely with the Disability Services Office. The Deaf Hard of Hearing Services Coordinator actually um, reaches out to faculty members who have a student who's deaf or hard of hearing in their course. Uh, actually uh, several weeks before classes start to encourage them to get their videos captioned um, with the information technology unit. The online learning services group actually, um, um, uh, they host the Kaltura and the Blackboard platform, so we've been able to work with them on, on incorporating accessibility into the platform. The instructional design team, we do a lot of training and handoff with them in terms of working closely with faculty. Uh, when they bring together faculty uh, development workshops, they'll bring us in and talk about accessibility and about the need to get content captioned. We work, we just finished working with the library on a streaming media policy, and part of that policy involves how we address the library uh, collections uh, or the content that's already in the library collections in terms of um, making sure that content's accessible. And we, again, we work closely with the Office of Distance Education in terms of making sure accessibility is incorporated in the very beginning of the course development process. So uh, who's using the service? We've had over 150 faculty, faculty and staff members make requests since we started the process. We've been also been able to track which schools, colleges, and units makes the most requests, or most, most requests, the top three being the School of Engineering, our College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and our College of Science. The nice thing about how we've positioned everything, and I talked about being a part of the Compliance, Diversity, and Ethics Office, is that we've been able to change the conversation from, well, I don't have a student who's deaf or hard of hearing in my course, to, okay, now I, need, I know I need to comply, so how do I do it? And so all of the uh, uh, process changes that I've been talking about really have been about how do we make it easy for faculty members to comply. A lot of faculty members really do want to do um, 
they, they really do want to make their courses accessible. They really want to do what we're asking them to do, but we've really made a concerted effort to focus on how do we make it easy for them to do what they need to do. And so you'll see almost a, a three fourths, of, a three quarters of the content that we caption is for compliance for the e-course, and uh, about a fourth of that is for disability accommodation. And so our next steps are really just to continue to assess our workflow and, and clean it up. I mentioned here is the third option under assess workflow is all options on the table. Um, I've met some of my colleagues at conferences who are doing some really good things in-house and some who are doing some really um, interesting things around um, um, uh, 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 grants or financial grants for academic units to be able to get them to caption their own stuff. So. We, we really are thinking about how we can actually do a more comprehensive um, um, solution here and, and get everybody to, to find a solution that they think works better for them. Um, and so all options really are on the table in terms of how we clean up our workflow. Um, things to continue to improve campus buy-in. Um, again, I told you about how we, we know who's request captions, what faculty members, what departments they've come from, what schools and colleges they're part of. Part of. So the ones who aren't, uh, who haven't completely bought in, we can do very targeted marketing around getting those folks um, and spreading the word in those particular areas. Um, the other nice thing is that uh, with Kaltor, everything's located in one place. So it's a little easier for every, knowing everybody's going to be using this platform and we're doing everything to put the uh, right infrastructure in place for this process um, will help as well. And as far as improving costs and timelines, that really has to do with negotiating better outsourcing costs and um, continuing to make sure the requests over a certain time frame um, don't get bogged down in the office. They're more cost effective for us to send it out. And so the final thing I'll mention are things to consider for your institution. Think about what your budget and your priorities are, are now in terms of trying to figure out your process. Not in-house doesn't work for everybody and outsourcing doesn't work for everybody, but think about what works best for your institution. Um, Build your infrastructure first. That was one thing that we stumbled through during that pilot process, but I'm glad we went through it. Um, it, it. The best thing we probably could have done was maybe remove the students from that early part um, and just gave them the files to actually caption. That probably would have helped us a little bit more as well. Involve your stakeholders early. Um, we didn't get the library and the Office of Distance Education and all those folks involved early, and so that's why we ran into some stumbling blocks. Um, out the gate in terms of marketing that initial uh, docs off pilot that we put out there. And um, as far as insourcing ver in house versus outsourcing, just think about what fits, what model fits best for your institution. If you have a institution in the culture where everybody's going to buy in and you have students that that can do an effective job captioning and they'll be with you for a couple of years, then by all means go for go for an in-house process. If not, and outsourcing fits better because you don't have the staffing or the time um, to actually build up some kind of model, think about that as well. Um, put policies in place that people will find and follow, that people will, uh, will uh, read and follow. That's helpful as well. And the last thing I'll mention is training, 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 training. As much as you can get out in front of people and educate them about how to do it, uh, about how to take advantage of the process that you put in place, that really helps down the road as well. So one thing we've been pushing big time about training is not just to have, not just to try and get FaceTime, but to also have just-in-time tools that sit uh, on our website. So you'll notice on our website we have a training guide, we have a video training library to kind of match that training guide, and we still try to get fa FaceTime in front of faculty and staff as well. Uh, and those things have been effective strategies for us to continue to market our service as well. And that is it. I ran a little over, so I'll turn it over to Lily for questions. Great. Thanks so much, Corey. So before we start answering your questions, and again, feel free to continue to type questions into the box in your control panel, we have one more poll for you if you want to answer that while we compile your questions. How do you foresee your captioning needs changing in the next few years? And you can select increasing significantly, increasing moderately, staying the same, or decreasing. And we'll give you a second to answer that. So no surprises, I guess. Uh, most people foresee captioning requirements increasing for their institution. 
either significantly or moderately, and a few of you think that, that it'll probably stay the same. So that's really helpful, thank you. And as we start answering questions, just keep in mind that we have some resources on the screen, and we will include some more resources in our email that we send out along with a recording of this webinar with captions and the slide deck. I know a couple of you asked about that. So Corey, let's get started with the first question. Okay. Someone is asking if you could talk more about your relationship with IT and DSO and faculty, and specifically how you work with them to provide campus-wide captions. Um, with the Information Technology Unit, um, there are two specific offices we work mostly with. One is the Instructional Design Team. Um, they have played a, a large role in helping faculty transition their face-to-face -face, face -face courses to um, online. And so we work to provide the instructional designers with training on how to incorporate accessibility into the course development process. Part of that includes the captioning process. And we did have one instructional designer in the very beginning who was basically our guinea pig in the captioning pilot process. Um, and we've had other instructional designers who given us a lot of feedback on ways we can improve or try to get more faculty buy-in. So that's, that's one unit. The other unit um, in ITU that we worked closely with was online learning services. And online learning services, um, they manage the Kaltura video management platform, but they also manage Blackboard. And so in terms of being able to figure out how we push content from Blackboard into, I'm sorry, from Kaltura into a Blackboard courses, because uh, we've had to do a lot of handoff with that during the pilot process now. Um, that's one other way that we've uh, worked closely with online learning services. We also we also work with them on um, using the 508 player, which is Kaltura's accessible media player, uh, accessible video player, as opposed to just using the standard skins that they have available. And with disability services, it really involved us working closely with the deaf and hard of hearing services coordinator to identify what classes the students who are deaf and hard of hearing are enrolled in. Um, get, making sure those faculty members know that any videos in their class needs to be captioned and getting those faculty members, uh, educating them on how they submit their videos to us to be captioned. I hope that, I think that answers your question. Yeah, great answer. Um, so another question here is asking where the money came from and whether debts chip in at all or if it's generally university money. Actually, no, it's all, all central funding. So our money has come from central funding. And I think part of the reason is because in the past we, we were having fights with disability services about who pays. Because they had a tight budget, we had a tight budget. And so that we, when we wrote our proposal, it went um, specifically up through the provost office and to try and get central funds to back it. And so at this point, we essentially have um, central funds backing whatever we do. So if if, for example, we run over our budget, then Central will cover any overruns. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. So there are a few questions in here about your outsourcing process, people asking specifically where you're outsourcing to and if you could just talk about your approach to outsourcing. Um, our approach now is to focus on vendors who have relationships with Kaltura. Since Kaltura, um, is going to be the basis of our, our um, video process here on campus. We're focusing on outsourcing vendors who have relationships with Kaltura. Uh, we've used a number of different um, outsourcing um, of companies. We've used 3Play Media, we've used Automatic Sync, we've used CLO24, we've used a lot of different ones. So we've used some local ones here in the state of Virginia. Um, so we've, we've had an opportunity to test a lot of different um, resources who are out there. Great, thank you. Um, a lot of people are noting that the challenge that you've experienced appears to be less the tech side and more the, the person hours needed to do a comprehensive program. They're wondering if you could talk more about your coaching and training process for grad students and staffers. Well, the coaching and training process, the tech process was the huge part of it in the beginning, honestly. Um, and it was, the tech process was huge in terms of figuring out what we were going to do, what platform we were going to use. Now once you figure out what platform you were going to use, once we settled on YouTube, it was training the students and ourselves on how we go and actually caption within YouTube. 
And again, it was training on several different tools because we were using DocSoft at the time, Transcript Editor to do some um, editing. We were using Movie Captioner to do some editing. We were using um, YouTube uh, itself to do some editing. And so when we brought students in, we really talked about all of those tools and said, whatever you find easiest to use, go ahead and use. But we're going to show you how to look. We'll, we'll show you how all three work. Now, that was effective for us. For some people, it may just be we're only going to use YouTube or we're only going to use whatever and then you kind of go that route. Now once you settle on some tools and some platforms then it's just a matter of uh, writing out a workflow that everybody can kind of follow and figure out, uh, follow and you know, kind of fall in line with and that's what we were able to do with some of the different tools that we used. Now as far as um, um, coaching with faculty and staff it really has to, it, it had more to do with in-house we figure out what what's an easy way for people to kind of fall in line in terms of making requests and getting feedback from faculty and, and instructional designers on what was difficult what wasn't difficult and blah 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 and once we kind of took all that feedback and incorporated it back into our process it resulted in an online process that made it easy for people to submit stuff it resulted in you know a few different ways that faculty members could get the videos to us um, and it resulted in us going and talking to the instructional designers and educating them on exactly how they make requests. And once we were able to kind of get our quote unquote mouthpieces out there to, to kind of echo what we wanted to, we, we, what we would want to say in front of people, that helped a lot as well. Great, thanks. So what have you done about existing media content that never was captioned and how far back did you go if you did caption existing media? For existing media that hasn't been captioned we focus mainly we've done that basically on an as-needed basis so if a faculty member um, has video from the library that they then want to incorporate it into their class they can submit a request and we'll have it captioned but we don't go back and just start looking randomly at the collections um, that was one thing we thought about doing early on and it just became, you know, you're really just, it's, it's a drop in the bucket, it's just, it's too much. So we just kind of focused on everything going back on an as-needed basis. So a faculty member makes a request to the library, the library gets that request to us as far as getting it captioned, and we work with the library on digitizing it, captioning it, and making sure that it's um, streamed through the proper channels. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So there are a few questions here about copyright and fair use issues. Um, we have a pretty in-depth blog post that we will include in the resources later that, that goes over copyright for captioning existing videos for education. But Corey, if there's anything you want to add to, to your discussion of copyright, I'm sure people would be interested. The only thing, uh, the, uh, there are a couple of things I'll add to that. In terms of copyright, we made a concerted, we made a decision in the beginning that we would err on the side of accessibility over copyright. So if you've got a student in the class who needs the video and everybody else is going to be watching this video but you know it would get flagged for copyright because the faculty, mem faculty member is just throwing it up there, we're going to make sure that the video is captioned so that student has exactly what they need. Um, with the library, we've had a lot of discussions around um, copyright issues and, and accessibility issues and we've really tried to partner closely with the library to make sure that we address any copyright challenges up front and so uh, part of it part of the copyright part of the um, our, our um, um, copyright manager I, don't, I can't even think of what Claudia's title actually is but, but she's in charge of the copyright office and so we partner closely partner closely with her the media services librarian and the distance education librarian to really try and address any issues around copyright. But they know that our attitude and our practice is that we are going to err on the side of accessibility if we have to. That's a great response. Thank you. Um, so someone else is asking, are you captioning for the entire university or just for accommodation requests? No, we are actually captioning for the entire university. Um, so we will accept requests from any faculty or staff member for videos for um, videos that are going to be used in face-to-face, -face, um, online, or um, on uh, online courses or on web websites. So we'll caption for any of those. Our priority is, of course, students who are deaf and hard of hearing and their needs in the classroom. But we'll caption for anybody 
um, in terms of compliance. And so as you saw in the numbers earlier, uh, three quarters of what we get are people who are, are complying and not just, you know, wondering whether or not they have a student who's deaf or hard of hearing in their, in their class. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's another question here uh, asking whether there are specific DE courses like core or required courses um, that come along with, with captioning policies specifically, um, like all videos in those courses need to be captioned? To my knowledge, no. As far as any specific online programs, I do not know of any. It's, it is the practice of the Office of Distance Education, though, for any courses, um, any online courses that are coming through their umbrella, which is pretty much most of the online courses here at the university now, um, they're going to be looked at for, for accessibility, and captions being a part of that accessibility. Great, thanks. So there's a question here about uh, whether your marketing department closed captions their videos, um, or if you don't have a, a department that produces marketing videos, uh, whether or not there's any captioning involved in your marketing. No, that's actually a good question. I'm pretty sure our marketing department is not captioning most of the videos. We will reach out to them to try and caption, give videos captions. If we see things that go up online, I mean, by, by no means have we covered everything here. So um, there are a number of um, units, and that might include our marketing department, that don't always think about captioning up front. And so because we have a process, we can actually start to push more, and not, we're not as worried about the technology part. We can start marketing, you know, from our own perspective, we can start marketing a little more effectively, and that's one of the units we probably need to work closely with. Thanks. So someone else is asking what tools and strategies you use to track your metrics, like minutes or who's requesting, uh, that kind of thing. Well, mainly everything is done through SharePoint. And so manually we looked at, um, manually we look when people kind of submit minutes and all that kind of stuff. Originally we were pulling everything in using Common Spot. We'd, we'd um, basically pull all the information in that comes in. We can um, upload it into a spreadsheet. The big part is really to have that as a part of the um, online request form. So we have the faculty members input how many minutes and um, you know and, and all that kind of detail. And then when this, once it gets pulled in, we can actually just start quantifying that stuff after a while. Thank you. Um, so how did you work with the library to make existing content accessible? Um, with the library, it really there are a couple of different things that happen. When a request comes in, um, oftentimes we will check it to see if the library owns a copy of it already. If the library owns a copy, then we will reach out to the media services librarian and say, hey, you own a copy of this, can you check to see if it's captioned already? And they will go, because their database, their online database is not in totally up to date to, uh, to identify which videos are captioned and which aren't. And so once they um, receive a request from us to actually go and check that resource. They'll check the resource to see if it's captioned. If it's captioned and the only thing we're talking about is having it digitized, they'll digitize it for us and then we'll get the link to the faculty member. If it's not captioned, then what happens is the library will digitize it, get the file back to us, and then we will outsource it to have it captioned or either we'll caption it in-house depending on the length of the file. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one question here is, what's the most labor-intensive part of the process? I would say that's the captioning itself. So manually sitting down and captioning, and, and that's one of the reasons we had to cut down the number of minutes um, that, you, that we actually process in-house. Um, in the early part of the process, I was doing a lot of the manual captioning myself. And the caption something that's 60 minutes, um, 90 minutes is just very difficult to do um, if that's not your day job. And when I'm doing that and balancing all these other different things I had to do here in the office, as well as other staff members too, if that wasn't your sole duty, then it's a very difficult thing to do and it can easily run into days on end where you have things just sitting that aren't getting done or you have this video that really needs to go out and you're still stuck trying to edit it and clean it up. So. The biggest part really is the, the transcription and cleanup part itself. Thank you. Um, so there's a question here about how difficult it was to get stakeholders to buy in and whether or not there are still outliers in your organization. 
Mm -hmm. There are outliers. Um, the outliers have more to do with. Um, I'm sure there are some folks who are still thinking about it as you know. Well, I don't have anybody who's deaf or hard of hearing. Um, there are folks who just don't know because, again, the university can easily be siloed and they're just not paying attention, um, or they don't think about the need. Like you, you, somebody mentioned marketing. Marketing, marketing is a good example of um, you know a, a unit that uh, probably needs to think a little bit more in terms of accessibility and. and and broadening their over, their reach, but um, they're not considering it. Um, so I would say that yes, those as far as the academic units that have been bought in, I would again probably piggyback off the two previous responses, which is that many don't know the service probably exists, and some think of about it more in, in terms of I don't have a student who's deaf or hard of hearing who has an immediate need. Great. Um, so if you knew back when you started what you know now about getting buy-in from faculty to have video captioned what would you have done differently i think what we would have probably done differently um a few things um, we would have known up front which platform we were going to use we would have known up front um what we were actually going to train the students on that way we would have given the, the students the best opportunity for success and in my eyes that would have been focusing on transcripts um, the training part with DocSoft and, and all those other kinds of things, there, we, what you're seeing with, with us is our process, which is what's worked for us and what we've kind of used to figure out. There are a lot of people who are just outsourcing videos. Um, they're outsourcing their stuff to have it transcribed, but then they're doing the time stamping in-house. And then you have other folks who are using, say, DocSoft to have their stuff time stamped, and then it goes up for somebody to clean out the, trans the transcript. There are a lot of different strategies that can be used. Um, this is just ours, and it's worked very effectively for us. But I think um, if we had known more about what all these other folks were doing, um, maybe knew a little bit more about what, the, what challenges they they had encountered, I probably would have spent more time doing doing some research to kind of find out about other folks who were doing captioning to kind of find out where the hiccups were and where we, we could have saved ourselves some time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, so someone is asking if you have any comparative data or lessons for community colleges that are looking for captioning solutions. No, I don't have any comparative information for community colleges. Um, what I would encourage is um, there are a couple of listservs out there. One is DSHE, which is D-S-S-H-E, um, Disability Support Services in Higher Education. Um, DSHE is a listserv. There's also the AHEAD listserv, which is the Association of Higher Education and Disability. Both of those listservs, if you were interested in sending an email, just kind of well, getting registered with those listservs, but sending a, an email out to them to kind of find out what other uh, institutions of higher education are doing, I think those would be great places to start in terms of finding out um, what's out there. Another listserv that I would mention is Athen which is the Accessible Technologists in Higher Education Network. And Athen is more the folks who do what I do in, in higher education. Um, DISHI and, and AHEAD are, are folks who are mo most, more so situated in the dis Disability Services Office and they're not really as technology heavy. But one of those three listservs I think will be very helpful in terms of finding out more information about uh, other institutions of higher education that are doing the same thing. Thanks, Corey. Those are really helpful resources. I think that at this time we're going to wrap up. There are still some unanswered questions, but we'll make sure we get back to you about those. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us. And Corey, thank you so much for a great presentation. Thanks, Lily. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Take care.